We're looking here about infrastructure uh, and cloud. Um, clearly, there's a lot of talk about cloud and cloud just being someone else's computer um, and moving things onto a more modern infrastructure to enable you to have the flexibility and scalability uh, the businesses are now demanding. Um, I recently did a, an exercise for a Premier League football club as a data discovery and application discovery um, across their decentralised estate and found they had 178 apps out on running live uh, across a business of only 400 people. Um, so on a, on a ratio basis, they then got a hell of a lot of things that have just been put in, just moved around. Uh, and of course, the new head of technology coming into that club was saying, well, how do I build an infrastructure to support this? A, when I don't know what it is. Uh, and B, how do I understand where this is going to move me going forward as I look to rationalise them? I don't want to build something now that is rigid or is inflexible. Uh, I want to build something that is scalable uh, and can help us move us forward. Um, so to talk about all of those sorts of themes, uh, introducing Simon McDermott, uh, Senior Systems Engineering Manager at Nutanix. Thank you very much. Good uh, afternoon. How is everyone doing? Good. So could I just get a show of hands? Who's actually heard of Nutanix? Wow. Who's actually a Nutanix customer? One. Excellent. Excellent. Sorry, did you say as well, yeah? Brilliant. So what I want to do today is just to give you a, um, it's kind of like a, almost like a high level view of where we're going as an organization to sort of give you some food for thought. Um, and what I'll do is I'll actually start off with where we started off as an organization and what we were sort of doing for the last three, four years and, and where we're ultimately going to be going in the, uh, in the future. So, you know, the, the, it's one of these buzzwords that, um, you know, I think a lot of people like to hear now invisible infrastructure cloud you know everything that's uh, you know pe people want to hear around you know they, they don't want to own infrastructure they just want to consume it as a service etc and that's really where we've been over the last you know three four year, uh, years ultimately Nutanix started off as a storage subsystem for a virtualization distributed storage fabric and then we moved into this uh, newfangled term called um, hyperconverged infrastructure HCI so in terms of where, where we've been, you know, our ethos in terms of what we've done is always about simplicity. Um, and you know, we've, we've coined the term uh, one-click one click simplicity. So everything that you do from a Nutanix perspective can be done in one click, you know, and really, really simplifying enterprise IT. And in terms of what we've been doing, it's you know, very much around, the, as I said, the hyper-converged space. So you know, around compute, storage, virtualization, networking very much falling in in line with IT ops and DevOps as a sort of process, but also, you know, having that um, almost like the enterprise IT at, at a consumerization level. So, you know, if you look at some of the, the, the things that we've offered from our platform, it's very much like cloud-like economics. So you, know, you can see here what will be presented with um, Amazon from you know, various different services as EC2 for compute. We have the ability to do, obviously, compute from a Nutanix perspective. And then block services, vice versa, we have the same file systems and as well as a container. Just to show hands, who's actually actively doing DevOps, or sorry, uh, Docker containerization within the organization? Okay, challenging? Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> That's a choice word, yes, indeed. So really where we're going now as an organization going forward is, dare I say, we're, we're, we're converging clouds so one of the things that you know, for, for you know, for people go way way back, I almost call it like a, a abstraction. Do you remember way way back in the day, Microsoft termed hardware abstraction? So you basically could install the operating system, whatever hard, um, hardware you wanted. So very much I look at it as we're abstracting cloud from the user. You know, you don't need to worry about the discrepancies between Google and AWS and Azure in terms of a cl cloud platform and what is actually required to run your workloads on on those platforms. So that's where we're very much headed. So it's, as I say, the term converging of clouds is very much what we're, we're, where we're going. And what we're doing is, you know, we, we've seen um, a, a proliferation of different types of clouds. I don't know if you'll agree with me. You know, we've now got enterprise clouds. We've also got sort of like remote or distributed clouds. Um, but we've also seen, a, 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 you know, from an IT perspective, edge-based clouds now coming out. So edge-based applications, very much apparent around things like IoT, for example. And that's where we're starting to see things. But the other thing about converging the clouds is that it almost converges the OPEX and CAPEX argument or the, the models that people have. So you can really choose as to what way that you want to start paying for your IT and change between them you know, in terms of the applications. And also the, the actual uh, the consumption of those two. So we have a, a thesis in uh, Nutanix. I 
keep, be prepared to argue with me if you want, but we sort of see that 60 to 70% of workloads in an organization are predictable. You know what they are. You know what they're going to consume from a resource or storage perspective, networking perspective. And we have a thesis, as I say, that those predictable workloads will live inside the enterprise. Where we see public cloud coming into the play is for those elastic workloads. So for example, if you actually have a sorry, seasonal, for one, say in retail, for example, where you have um, spikes in your actual computation, for example, or your batch processes, you can very much burst out into the cloud and very much run those workloads uh, uh, as you see fit. But one of the things you know, that we've started looking at, as I said, the convergence of cloud is you know, the, be, being able to migrate workloads between various different clouds, be it your own inter enterprise cloud internally with Nutanix, or you may want to migrate it out into AWS or Azure or, or Google as well. And that's where we actually have now, uh, and we'll touch on it a, a little bit briefly, is CAM. So I don't know if those, those are existing customers in the room, have you heard of CAM yet? No? Just heard of it? So CAM is, is, is where we're very much heading. And I'll just give you a, a quick synopsis of what CAM is. We've, we've moved in terms of our viewpoint. So you know, up until now, or say last year, we were very much infrastructure focused, storage focused, converged focused. But where we very much see the world going now is um, it's app centric. Everything's around applications. And what CAM is, is a, a basically an app centric automation and orchestration tool that will allow you to move workloads between various different clouds, but also allow you to um, um, upgrade um, and even downgrade, for example, those various different applications that you have within your enterprise. We also have a thing as well, you know, where we've had customers come to us and say, you know what, I've got certain environments or certain applications that I want to offer as a service. But the key thing for them is I don't want to have to start looking at things that have got different tooling behind them. And on the back of that, we, uh, we very much can see that, you know, this elastic workload basically will allow you to run these different ser um, as a service, your different workloads. And that's where we've created Zai. So Zai is, is basically a service that's going to be coming out. Um, it'll be partnered with, um, you know, across uh, America initially, but then obviously into Europe and APJ. But we can offer, you know, the ability to offer environments or applications as a service on top of the Zai service framework. Okay. So, you know, as I said, you know, we had touched on earlier around, you know, the various different clouds. And, you know, once you start converging the clouds, it, it's cloud, you know, regardless of it's whether it's in the enterprise or if it's um, you know, a, a public-based cloud, they're, they're pretty much synonymous, in my opinion, once you start getting to that level. So what we've started seeing is, you know, and this is where we're very much going with our whole one OS uh, type of attitude, is you know, we've got our core cloud internally, and then we can also have, we're starting to see a lot of use cases for customers as well, where we have a variety of different distributed clouds, as I call it. So you, know, you may have branch office. In the case of retail, you may actually have you know, um, stores for out there that have a, a need to have their own IT um, requirement on site. But also as well, the, one of the, the biggest use cases for distributed cloud is DR, you know, DR as a service. Many, many of you guys ha have a DR service that goes out to a cloud, public cloud. Yeah, so you know, it's a very, very um, critical workload for a lot of customers and it's a very, very critical um, use case as well. But where we're, we're starting to see now, as I mentioned earlier, and it's really where uh, a lot of the conversation around cloud is heading is this concept now of age cloud, okay? So the thing that I've really seen is, is in and around you know, IoT. So you, you've got a lot of these devices that are sending a lot of metrics or telemetry data back to a point. And really, you know, age cloud will start to sort of um, concentrate or concatenate a lot of the data. And that's where we start seeing a lot of these things, you know, where you, you know, it's very much on, on a device level as opposed to a sort of, um, you know, a VM level, so to speak. So in terms of, uh, you know, just to give you a, an overview of where we sort of see in, in the various different levels of technology that we have within our foundation. So, you know, this, this is the only stack I will show you today, by the way. Um, I, know, I know a lot of people love showing stack diagrams and these things. But, you know, this is very much the, the, the stack of technologies, the capabilities that we have within our portfolio on, on what it really much allows you to do. So as I said, you know, earlier, this is where we sort of started, more or less, you know, this concept of having hyper -converge. And I like to think of it almost like um, 
I don't know if you guys have ever seen the Nutanix advert around the cloud builder with the bricks, the various different bricks. This is what I very much think, you know, HCI is a fundamental, a foundational brick element of what we're trying to do within enterprise cloud, distributed cloud, edge cloud, whatever you want to call it. But you know, it's very much taken the sort of infrastructure um, that we have of yesterday and today and very much converging it um, to, to get, you know, economies of scale, scalability, flexibility, everything that you guys love about cloud in terms of, you know, the, the, the benefits that it brings to an organization with flexibility. So this is, as I said, where we very much started off, and it's a fundamental building block of, of what we're doing. In terms of then you know, virtualization, you know, one of our key mantras within Nutanix is, you know, giving the customer the choice to do what they want, okay? So, you know, we, we, um, so, you know, a lot of you guys have probably got ELAs with VMware. You may want to continue using ESX. Um, some people have maybe gone with Hyper-V, some with Citrix Zen Server. So we have support for all the, the popular hypervisors. However, one of the key things that we do have, which is one of our crown jewels in my opinion, is we actually have our own hypervisor as well, AHV. So those guys that have deployed, have you, have you deployed AHV or are you ESX? You've gone AHV? Brilliant, excellent. So the question I ask you is, if you go to Amazon and you want to sp spin up some workloads, does the hypervisor matter? Doesn't, does it? So you know, why should it really matter from an enterprise perspective what hypervisor you run? You know, we believe that there's a lot of, uh, shall we say, um, a lot of tension over the, this whole concept of enterprise virtualization and hypervisor. At the end of the day, when you go to a public cloud, you don't have any say over what hypervisor has actually been used or what operating system. You're paying for a compute or a piece of um, workload as a service, okay? <coughs> One of the key things around AHV is obviously it's very, very integrated with the entire Nutanix stack because obviously it's our um, hypervisor. But one of the key things is when you buy Nutanix, you get AHV for free. It's license free. And a lot of customers have seen that as a, a really good way of um, streamlining costs within their data center and uh, going forward. So then if we go up, you know, and this is really where we start to see a lot of the, the real power, or customers have started to see a lot of the real power behind Nutanix in terms of, you know, the actual one-click operations that I mentioned earlier. Just having that ability to completely simplify IT operations be it from a deployment perspective or even just from an administration perspective. You know, so we've got the ability to, to do a lot of you know, pretty, pretty much instantaneous provisioning of VMs using templates within, you know, as you would from a hypervisor. But one of the key things that we have is a, a lot of um, telemetry data around the actual workloads that are actually taking, um, sitting on the actual infrastructure itself. And we can provide a lot of reporting and, and a lot of scaling. So one of the things that we actually have is this um, concept called runway. And within Runway, you can actually say that our, our management GUI is a thing called Prism. You can go into um, Prism and you can start modeling additional workloads. You can say, okay, I've got X, Y, and Z workloads on, our, on, my, uh, on, my, on my Nutanix in, uh, environment at the minute. What would it take for me to start adding, say, a thousand VDIs on top of that? And it will actually allow you to model what is required in terms of additional capacity from a... From a um, you know, a uh, block perspective or no perspective going forward. So the other thing then on top of that is, you know, networking. So this is where we've done a, a lot of work recently and, and it, this, the release that's um, imminent has got a lot of work in this. But, you know, we've really focused down on networking. So one of the key things for a lot of um, cloud-based applications is security. Um, having security visualization is one thing, but as well as that segmentation. So, you know, being able to sort of ring fence or firewall the different VMs um, that you may have in your infrastructure against each other so you can start adding security policies in to say, you know, VM A cannot talk to VM B on, on certain ports, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a real key thing that we sort of, uh, we, we see going forward in terms of the, uh, the capability and the security that we have. And then also, as I mentioned there, the application automation. This is CAM that we talked about, you know, and being able to sort of very much have a policy-based governance over your applications that will allow you to do pretty much upgrades or you can pretty much do migrations to different clouds, for example, or, um, you know, be it, as I said earlier, Nutanix cloud, or you could go to an AWS or a, a, a GCP cloud. The other key thing about this, and this is where it becomes, uh, you know, this concept people have a shadow IT, you know, pretty much people going out and buying things as they want. You can actually start doing a self, um, software service provisioning portal within CAM. So you can actually offer out applications 
or say VMs to your developers or your test or QA departments within your organization. And you can say, okay, I need um, you know, a, a three VM deployment for X, Y, and Z. It needs to include SQL or MySQL or, or Hadoop or any of the sort of other workloads we have. And what it will basically do is it will go and start spinning up those um, workloads or those VMs as part of that application. Any questions so far? No? And then, you know, as I said, the, the, the key thing is where we're really going. And I think it's, you know, it's, it, it, it fundamentally is, you know, one of the problems that, that really sort of happened from you know, years ago is, you know, the, having this abstraction of um, different clouds. You know, there are a lot of different challenges around hardware. So therefore, you know, what, what we've got in terms of the, the various different clouds and the challenges it provides from a tooling perspective and a monitoring perspective, for example, and what we, where we're going to address that. So as I said, that's where CAM also f fits in. But it allows you to, as I said, very easily deploy and manage different applications across any cloud. And the other key thing is as well, is it, it will give you a visibility of what you're actually consuming from a public cloud perspective. So you can start to get a sort of ready um, reckoner in terms of what your costs of deploying that application within an AWS, for, for example. So um, as I said, you know, so, you know, going, going forward, and I've left some time for Q&A, so p please do ask some questions. You know, very much our mantra going forward is this one OS. You know, the actual cloud itself shouldn't be around the actual operating system or, you know, the infrastructure, the capability. It's there as an enabler for your business to actually um, deploy applications, run applications, and to add benefit to your organization. You know, we're still keeping the actual simplicity of one click. So in everything that we do, is, it's all about the actual making it as simple as, you, as possible for the IT admins within the organization. And you know, we've got the variety of different um, use case clouds that we can cater for uh, across the different platforms that we have. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Simon. Um, question from the floor first. Anyone got anything particular to ask from there? And I've got a couple. So, so in, in a sentence, you've got a management overlay piece of software which can work across any different clouds. Yeah. So, instead of me going to it, instead of my guys going to Azure and buying it and whatever, we can go to you and, and, and spin up a bit of Azure and a bit of this and a bit of your own private one. Yeah. Fluff around, do bits and pieces. Yeah, you and work it as a, a effectively a multi-cloud provider system yeah. with one management overlay. Across. Yeah. So the key thing is having that. You're 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 getting away from you know. Anybody that's deployed any VMs on, on, on the various different cloud providers, there, there's differences across you know, the virtual hardware, for example. So we're, we're lifting it at a level above that in terms of managing the application so it itself. transposes between different virtual environments? Yes, well. that's what CAM does. That, that's the, the engine behind it, yeah, pretty much. You know, you, st you still, you know, for example, you may be um, uh, an AWS customer, and all of a sudden um, Microsoft might come along with a much better deal for you in terms of the VM cost, for example. So being able to simply just migrate those workloads across seamlessly, and you obviously get the benefit of the financial benefit behind it. So yeah, it's very much, um, you know, it, it, it shouldn't matter. I think at the, at the end of the day, the cloud shouldn't matter in terms of what it is. You're, all you're interested in is your applications, really. That's the bottom line. Hi. So when we, if you went and bought an AWS virtual server, you can choose whether you want to buy one that optimizes storage, whether they optimize the compute, mm -hmm. and so forth. And you pay different prices for different uh, solutions. Correct. And similar to, to, to Azure, similarly, if you're actually providing it internally, you've got to optimize all that. Does it actually provide any kind of uh, capability of working out, if you like, what your optimum load is on stuff, and then start looking in the cloud? And, are you actually kind of using any kind of thing where you're suggesting you can actually get away with a cheaper server on Azure? That's the uh, UI bit coming later. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to use that word. It's, I'm going to use that word that people hate. It, it is on the roadmap. Yes. <laughs> Had to get it in once. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, no, that, that is ultimately where we want to go. You know, that we're, we're providing sort of... Um, uh, financial ad advice or, or, or consideration in terms of, you know, what, and you will be able to plug in the costs of things in the CAM and basically be say, you know, if this type of VM will cost me, you know, $400 per month on AWS, it may cost me X on GCP, et cetera. So there is that sort of, how would I put it, financial awareness, I kind of guess, or a cost awareness that is going to be, but going forward, you know, it's, uh, you know, for those of who are actually existing customers, we, the, the amount of analytics that we provide today around the actual core HCI platform is astonishing. 
So going forward, you know, that same type of rich analytics in terms of consumption and costs and cost modeling, that will definitely be going forward, yeah. So if we, if we gave this to a, you know, you've got some data scientists who don't want to add anything to IT, they just want to go out and do everything in the cloud. If you mm -hmm. gave them this kind of front end, you could go and make it so they can choose whatever cloud provider they want. As they go and start provisioning, they've seen the relative costs of this, this provider over that provider or using the internal resource. <coughs> Yeah, yeah that, that, you could do it that way. Or the other way, look, is you're giving your data scientists the ability to spin up whatever they need. Where it actually sits and what it costs is irrelevant to them as long as they get what they need to do their job. So you, from an IT perspective, you're the one that's controlling the costs of what those are. Um, you know, in terms of the, the actual on-site or on-premise VMs versus the cloud VMs, you know, obviously, the danger with being public is, you know, you don't know, actually know what you're going to spend until you actually spend it, you know, which is one of the big problems with, with public cloud. People suddenly get these bill shocks, um, whereas at least, and, that, and that's one of the things where, you know, where we very much put ourselves forward as saying, you, you know, you've bought the internal side of things, use it because that's, you, you've already invested in it. It's very much, you know, if you've got that burst capability that you want to do or, or deployment of different workloads because you've got a, an additional requirement or it's an elastic workload that you might not be able to cover with your existing infrastructure in the private cloud, then that's the type of thing that you would very much look at it for. So we kind of have some of those sorts of capabilities, but the thing we have with data scientists is sometimes they just want to do enormous work yep. which are going to be straining our internal systems. Mm. And again, knock it up and do it in Azure and it costs them you know, next to nothing. Yep. They're only using it for half a day and yep. we've done the compute that we can't provide. And so they end up getting very antsy with us because we're not <laughs> providing enough internal yeah. resources yeah. for them. And what I wouldn't want to do is take away their freedom to be able to do that. Yeah. But, you know, what I'd want is a system that can say, you know what, you're a bit busy internally and your, you know, other clients are using all of your um, servers at the moment and they don't want to actually be impacted. So I'm going to field this. And yeah. I'm going to field it to the best place no, absolutely. I mean, that's that's a really good example. You know, something that has a huge storage requirement or a huge compute requirement that you know you don't necessarily want that to impact your internal environment. Yeah, that would be that. And but you know, you're you're giving it a, just a simple portal for those guys to go to. Where it actually goes to is down to you in terms of um, you know the the actual cloud or what cost based on on, on whatever it's required. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed, you just, I've just given you a bigger stick, that's all. <laughs> Hi. Um, my question's about the edge. Edge, so, yeah. So I get the other workloads with yeah. those for a while. What, what, how do you envisage your relationship to those edge areas? T when you say relationship, can you um, well, elaborate? Well, that IoT stuff's going to be a different kind of workload. Absolutely. relationships, peer-to-peer, -peer, mm -hmm. you know, the, the processing at the edge, et cetera. How, how do you see that? So, God, without giving you away um, NDA information. So, yeah, well, I mean, the IoT is a completely different beast from, like, normal um, workloads. So we are um, developing, you know, platforms that will basically um, cater for those amount of transactions or devices, you know, because, you know, where you're talking maybe hundreds of thousands of VMs maybe, when you move to IoT, it's millions, billions of devices that are talking. So um, we're, we're, we're developing a sort of platform uh, in the same way that we have with um, you know, the internal enterprise side of things, we're developing a platform that will pretty much allow IoT as well. But you know, the, the thing about it is it's, it's a cloud and you can manage it within, from a Nutanix perspective, from that perspective as well. So your edge wasn't IoT really, was it? Your edge in this example <coughs> is more branch offices that have some kind of compute. No, that's distributed. So this is, sorry for pointing out, this is the distributed, so Robo DR, that's what we call distributed cloud. And then edge is in around, you know, that, that's probably the most prevalent um, thing today in, in terms Basically of where it's... Yes, data creators, you know, telemetry-based devices from IoT-based devices, that type of thing, where they've got, you know, to actually try and bring that into your internal organization, that telemetry data is probably madness in terms of scale and amount of data. So, you know, a lot of this sort of sits in the edge and then is bu bubbled down or can reduce down or condensed down in terms of va valuable data. Yeah, so... So, yeah. And this, this works... Just as well with private cloud, with so if you've got an SAP, uh, Salesforce, or Microsoft, and probably another half a dozen vendors like that who provide their cloud services, you are basically this hyper convergence. It's, it's managing that kind of.
so, so think, think of it as kind of like platform and infrastructure as a service. Anything that's software as a service is, you know, that you mentioned, like, for example, Salesforce, yeah. you know, that, that's very much, you go and consume that application as a service, really. What we're doing is providing the infrastructure or platform. You know, infra it, it was infrastructure as a service when it was typically HCI, yeah. but now we've moved into that, you know, with CAM and the sort of more app-centric approach. It's becoming a platform, you know, so you can think, do things like manage database upgrades or middleware, for example, anything that's um, more tightly um, aligned with the application itself as opposed to the underlying infrastructure stroke hardware. Yeah. Yeah. So you said some of this has been around a while, so it's new. What, what's some of the big clients you're using the majority of what you've said there? Um, not, not just your database, but, you know, some of your... The actual... Manager, manager type thing. So, sorry, say it again? Yeah, so who, who are some of the big clients you've got who are using most of what you've talked about? So, so CAM is, is pretty much, it's, it's new, okay? So we don't actually have any customers live on it at the minute. If you look at it from a perspective of the, um, you know, the enterprise cloud, um, we've got some huge customers. The Department of Defense in America is probably the biggest. I mean, they've got, I think, 300,000 Zen desktops running on it. So it's pretty, pretty significant. And then there's a huge spectrum of um, UK-based, you know, um, but that's... Okay, so that, that's just selling your version of Azure, is it? Some yeah, yeah. And it's, 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 it's enterprise cloud. Bit, that's, that's yeah, I mean, this, this is, you know, where we're going now, I believe, is very unique uh, in terms of that abstraction of cloud or convergence of cloud, yeah. Agnostic. Agnostic. Oh, I'll use that one. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> 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 Write that one down. Yeah. No worries. Yeah, any, any other questions? I guess just to, just to wrap up, um, uh, not to use the word roadmap more than twice in the same, <laughs> in the same presentation. Yes, indeed. This area is obviously moving very quickly, uh, and certainly most people are looking at sort of 12 to 18 month strategies with cloud because of things like licensing fees and, and new competitors and disruptors in the market. Based on your model, um, what do you see your next 12 to 18 months looking like, uh, A, from an adoption point of view with, with a new platform, yeah. and B, where are you looking to take it next to, to identify the next challenge on and, and solve it? So I think, you know, what I spoke about was, you know, the Zai services, you know, being able to, to extend that cloud fabric out to organizations and be able to give them, you know, the ability to offer um, applications as a service themselves, you know, for, for when I say internal line of business applications as a service and, and obviously DR, you know, that's, that's where we're going. Um, you know, we're, we're, th these services are about to be released. Um, Zai is not actually available in, the, in EMEA yet. Um, it's due to be released in the, in the States sometime soon. But, you know, taking that and CAM and really moving it up into that sort of space of, um, you know, a, a, an app-centric view of the world. And I think as well as that, you know, this sort of edge, you know, the proliferation of clouds across, I know that the whole thing was to try and bring cloud, clouds into the uh, one management realm. But, you know, the, the edge side of cloud as well and some of the IoT things, I think that, that as well is another huge area for us going forward as well. Well, for me, that's been a really interesting look at a, a new way almost of, of looking at it. So thank you very much on my welcome. behalf. Please join me in thanking Simon. Thanks, guys.